Welcome back and welcome back, welcome back. I am Miss Lisa. This is my YouTube channel. Please like, share, subscribe. I'm trying to get a thousand subscribers so that I get to do YouTube live. <clears throat> and then we're here we talk about things that have to do with math and science. This class that we're talking about today is physical science. We're going through that book, <clears throat> but you don't have to have that book. You can learn about physical science. This is primarily designed as a class for homeschoolers, but if you like the way I explain things, come on in. We're going to talk about electricity, electricity. That's the Schoolhouse Rock electricity song. Um, so uh, last time I didn't mention, but there were two videos with it. So what I do with each chapter is I'm trying to do a content video, then a math video. And in the math video, I can zoom right in on my calculator and my paper and the problem. And instead of seeing me, you see the calculator, which is more important. So make sure like this one's going to have a second video too. Make sure you get that one also. All right. So electricity. Um, <clears throat> what is electricity? Well, where it comes from is atoms. Um, everything is made out of atoms. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've already, this is my fourth video today. I'm trying to get a lot of them done right now. But anyway, um, it comes from the atom. If you remember atoms, um, uh, not the guy atom, but atoms <laughs> are the building blocks of matter. They are the smallest piece of matter that retains the property of the element. So, like, for example, carbon, um, uh, one carbon atom would, would be like carbon. It would be like soot. It would be black. It would have the properties of carbon. But, but you could break it down. When John Dalton came up with the atomic theory, he said that atoms were like billiard balls and that they couldn't be broken down anymore, that they were the smallest piece of matter. But he was wrong. He was right that everything was made out of atoms, but he was wrong that they can't be broken down. Now we know that inside of an atom, there is a nucleus and made out of protons and neutrons and surrounding it are electrons. Protons are positive, neutrons are neutral, and electrons are negative. Um, and most chemistry is what is happening with the electrons. We don't mess with the nucleus because um, it that would be splitting the atom and you get bombs and things like that you don't want. But um, so how electron, how things would get a charge, an electric charge, is the electrons can be rubbed off or they can get more electrons on it. The, um, the positive part of the atom is in the nucleus, it's the protons and those don't change. They're going to stay. But so for a neutral atom, it has the same number of protons and electrons. So it's balanced and it's neutral. It has no charge. They cancel each other out. You can think of it like that. But if an atom has some of its electrons rubbed off, now it's got more protons than electrons. It would have, that atom would have a positive charge and it's called an ion, a positive ion. It's called a cation. And I always say, because cats are positive little creatures. And then I always have students go, no, we'll just wait. If an atom gains electrons, if it gets one, some from another atom, then it's got more negative than positive, and it has an overall negative charge because it's got more electrons than protons, so it's going to be negative. Electrons are negative, remember. Um, and when it has that, it's called an anion. And I say that cations are positive and anions are negative. Everyone says that. But I say how you can remember it is because here in Georgia, we have fire ants. And it's not ant ion, but it sounds a lot like it. And we can all agree that fire ants are negative here in Georgia. You get bit by them. It itches. It hurts. It's terrible. We hate fire ants. So we might debate about cats being positive, but we are in agreement that fire ants are negative. So anions are negative, cations are positive. Now, um, char charges can be transferred from one to another. <clears throat> Have you ever been um, in the wintertime and you got on socks, you're in your house and you took off your shoes and you're walking across your carpet and you reach out to touch the doorknob? What is going to happen to you? That's right, you're gonna get zapped. A little arc of electricity is gonna come and those charges are gonna be transferred and you're gonna feel a little shock. 
what has happened is called static electricity. Static means still. So if there is a, if someone says there is a static pond, that means it is a pond that the water's not moving and probably it's getting scummy and it's got lily pads on top. It's not, the water's not moving enough. It's getting yucky. Okay. So static means still. And then um, the opposite would be a, a stream, a current. And so the other thing is electricity can flow like a current. So we kind of use water to describe electricity a lot and to kind of understand what's going on because in a lot of ways it obeys similar principles that water does. Except with static water, it just kind of sits there. Static electricity can hop from one to another, from that doorknob to your finger. The reason why is because of this idea. Opposites attract. That's it. Opposites attract. So if you have an area of negative charge and an area of positive charge, they are going to attract and try to stick together likes repel. So if you have negative charge and negative charge, they will repel. Positive charge and positive charge will repel. If we were in class together, we would do this lab. And so this little activity. So I encourage you to do this. I would pass out to everybody two pieces of scotch tape. I would tell them to stick it on the, the table. Usually when I meet with homeschoolers, we meet around a big table. And so everybody takes their two pieces of tape and sticks it to the table. And then, but leave a little piece up to grab. And then you grab it and you pull it off. When you do, it causes electrons to get left behind. And then your two pieces of tape have become charged. And they're charged the same because you put them both on the table and you ripped them both off of the same table. If you take them together, your pieces of tape, you can see that they repel. They're going to bend away from each other until you touch them and then the, the charges will neutralize. But you get them closer and they'll bend away. It's like magic. It's a fun little thing. So everybody do that. Make a little note that I want you to do that. It's not in your book, but I want you to do the the magic tape lab. Easy, no, no big equipment, and it works good. It works better than some other things I've done through the years as I've taught this. I've taught this for decades, and we're not going to talk about how many. All right, so they talk, they show a picture of this in your book of people walking with their tennis shoes and the charges being transferred. Now, last time we talked about the law of conservation, and it is that matter and energy can neither be created or destroyed, but only transferred from one form to another. Um, it is the same thing with charge. Charge cannot be created or destroyed, only transferred from one to another. And remember I told you last time that that um, is a little, the law, not the law of conservation, but the law of entropy, that things move from order to disorder unless acted upon by an outside force is a little bit controversial. It's, it's an area of science where two parts of science dis sort of disagree. And, um, and I told you it's because of the theory of evolution, things are moving from disorder to order, which is going against the law of entropy, which says things move from order to disorder. But then I didn't tell you the um, what current evolutionists are saying. One of the leading current evolutionists is Richard Dawkins, and he says that there was an outside force, aliens. So some, some, uh, some evolutionists have addressed this problem, and Richard Dawkins says that how life came to our planet was aliens. So just know that, that they've thought about it. All right. So, um, uh, and there's other theories too. There's something called punctuated equilibrium and things like that, but we, and, um, uh, infinite parallel universes. So, but, um, we're not going to talk about that right now because we're talking about physics, but just knowing that those two Sometimes different branches of science disagree, is, was my takeaway from you, is that science isn't settled. There's room for you to be a scientist and discover something. Everything hasn't been discovered yet. There's lots of things we still don't know. We don't know if Richard Dawkins was right and it was aliens. We don't know. I mean, he's leading. He's like top, top guy. Um, but anyway, that's, that's what he says. Okay, um, next... Back to electricity. I just thought it got distracted because and I thought last time I forgot to tell them about that. They, they have thought about that. Um, uh, law of conservation of charge. We talked about that. Okay. And we talked about the next thing. Opposites attract, likes repel. Um, okay. And this actually can cause 
electrical. It's like my glass. Look at that. My glasses just broke. Ah, oh, such a pain. Um, it can, that it's not just right on the electron where this charge is. It makes a field around it, sort of like a field of power. So, and you can see that with your pieces of tape, that as you get closer, that it's not just the fact that there's charges on these, but they can influence outside uh, around them and make an electric field. And you're, you see it with your tape. And if it doesn't work at first, try it again. Tape's cheap. Keep doing it. It's really cool. All right. Um, the next thing they talk about is comparing electrical and gravitational force. Remember gravity. Everything with mass exerts a force on every other thing, a pull. The greater the mass, the greater the pull, the closer it is, the greater the pull. And they said even though gra gravity is so massive, the electrical forces are actually greater. It's just that because like the Earth is so big that gravity is real big. But, but if you have things of like mass, electrical pulls are actually stronger. And that's why like right now, my book has a force of gravity. It is exerting on me, sitting in front of me, but I can't feel it because neither me nor the book are massive enough. So you can't even tell that that, fo that force is there. But if you had a bunch of electricity right in front of me, I'd be more aware of that. <laughs> we'll say that. Um, okay, so then, so charges can build up, static electricity charges can build up and then move. Now, there are it, materials make a difference. Remember I said that you were in your sock feet, you were on carpet, you touched the metal doorknob. So there is electrical property that has to do with the physical property of matter. And some things are conductors and some are insulators. And it kind of, and we've talked about this before with heat, that there were certain things that conducted heat well and other things that insulated. And it turns out that it's very similar. Things that conduct heat usually conduct electricity and things that don't usually don't. And it goes back to whether or not they have loose electrons. Things with loose electrons do are very good at conducting heat and electricity. Things with tight electrons are not. And when you study chemistry, you'll know more about what that all means. But just know that metals are good conductors of electricity. Um, wood is not, wood, just like how we said before. So the insulators are things that don't conduct well, and you can read more about that. Also, um, Things can be um, charged by contact. You know that because you've got to charge your cell phone. I'll, I teach public school now, and ooh, it is. I have to be very dynamic to try to get their attentions away from their phones. All these kids on their phones, and homeschoolers too. I was teaching homeschoolers last year, and the kids would be all looking at their laps. And I know their laps aren't all that interesting. I'd go say, put away your phone. So. Science is complicated, and you know, there's a reason why it's got that reputation, and you really need to pay attention in science class and not look at your phone um, if you're really going to understand it. Put that phone away. I know it's tempting. I always want to look at my phone, too. I want to see my friends are texting me just like you, but put them away. All right. Now, charging at a distance. The greater the distance, the less charging. Um, the closer things are then um, there is going to have more effect of that electrical field. Now, lightning, let's talk about that. What happens with the lightning is that there gets built up on the bottom of a cloud static electricity of negative charges. And then as it's passing over, remember, likes repel. So if there are electrons on the ground, they scoot away. They scoot to the other side of the atom, leaving positive on the ground. So you have this negative cloud, this positive ground, and what do opposites do? They attract, and eventually the charges will build up till it jumps, and the, the stream of electrons will come off of the, the cloud, and you have your lightning bolt. Um, now, I always try to tell you things that are going to help you not die in science class, and this is one, is don't get struck by lightning. Lightning is attracted to whatever is tallest on the environment, and especially things that are round. Notice our little round heads. So lightning can be attracted to 
to you. Also, people will go and they'll stand under a tree. And what shape does a tree have on top? Round. And now it's the tallest thing. If the if you're standing under a tree and it gets hit like by lightning, it's not one little lightning bolt like Elvis's taking care of business's lightning bolt. It branches all over and you're going to get struck too. It happened recently. There were some kids in the Atlanta area and it was clouds coming up and they were getting on the bus and there was a boy who he had keys and he's tossing out the keys and, and catching them and um, lightning is attracted to metal also. And he's standing under a tree and the lightning hits and it killed killed the boy. So don't get, try not to get hit by lightning. Don't be the tallest thing on the, uh, out there. If it's lightning, go inside. Don't, don't even risk it. It's not worth it. And, um, it could just happen so fast, like lightning. Another thing is, is if you're outside and you suddenly feel all the hair on your arm, all the hair on your body start raising, like, you know, raising up, you can be hit by lightning. What you're feeling are those charges. So that happened to me once. We used to live in Douglasville, south of here, and I had a garden, and it had been raining, and then it stopped. So I thought I'd go out to the garden and pick some tomatoes to have with our, our meal that we were having. So I go out to the garden. Suddenly, all the hair on, on me starts raising up, all my arm hair and all that, and I thought, oh no, I'm about to get hit by lightning. It had just been raining. There was mud and water that deep in my garden. What you do is you get on the ground as fast as you can and lay as flat as you can. So I, boom, flattened myself into the mud without hesitation and the lightning hit a tree right by me instead because I wasn't the tallest thing on the on the landscape anymore. It was a Bradford pear in my neighbor's yard and the lightning hit it and it exploded. Blew the bark off of it. Absolutely split it. That tree was gone and I was just going, oh, I can't believe it. I almost got hit by lightning. That's the only time I've ever felt it. But if you suddenly feel all your hair on your arms stand up, flatten yourself as fast as you can. I don't care that it's muddy. I don't care that you got on your new clothes. You lay down as fast as you can, but it's better not to be out there. I shouldn't have even gone out there. I thought, eh, it's not raining anymore. You got to be careful. And you know, that's why they listen at the pool. If they hear thunder, you got to come out of the water for 20 minutes. And you know, I didn't wait the 20 minutes. I just went on out to the garden and almost paid the price. So, um, so important little things about lightning. Yeah, you can see it branching in the pictures in the book too. So grounding. Okay, let me tell you about that. If you get struck by lightning, um, the, the, it has to flow through you to kill you. Okay. It can't, if the lightning doesn't flow, it's not as, it's not deadly. So it has to flow to the ground if the lightning flows into the ground. So it would have killed me because I was standing on the ground. But, um, but that's how squirrels can run along the power lines because the, they, they might could even touch the electricity. But as long as there is not a path through the squirrel to the ground, they're okay. That's why birds can be on those power lines whether or not they have insulation on them or not, and they're okay. Um, and it's why you, uh, my neighbor growing up was in an airplane that got hit by lightning and he lived, um, it burned him wherever he had metal. So he had a metal framed glasses and it burnt there and it burnt where his zipper was. Um, but you know, he lived, <laughs> he got some burns, but he was okay. Um, but, uh, but one time at my mom's house, there was a squirrel who reached up to the power line while still standing on her roof. And so there was a, a path through the power line, through the squirrel from the roof all the way to the ground and it fried the squirrel. He was, he was dead right there. And you, I couldn't go up there and grab him because then I would be dead too. How your muscles work is by electricity. And so if you are shocked, your muscles contract. So if you're ever not sure if a wire is alive or not, you never touch it with the front of your hand because you would freeze onto it. Your, your brain would say, let go, but you could not. But if you touch it with the back of your hand and it's a live wire, it will cause your muscles to contract and throw it off. Now you always want the, to cut the power off. You want to make sure it's not a live wire. 
But if there's any doubt, and this is the other thing, you can cut the power off and then things still have electricity in them because there's this thing called a capacitor and they store electricity. And they can store enough electricity to give you a good shock. So um, even if the power's cut off, don't touch wires like this for the first time, touch them like that and it'll throw it off. So um, just a little electrical safety. Um, one time I had a student who was a hunter and he was out in the woods and there are not bathrooms out in the woods. So he went to relieve himself into a clump of bushes. But little did he know there was an electric fence there and the electricity went up his urine and shocked him very bad in a very sensitive place. Now, Mythbusters said that can't happen because urine normally has breaks in it. I guess his didn't because it happened to him. He said he had no idea until he was getting shot. Um, he must have been very close to it also, um, you know, because he, I'm sure for modesty, he was very, being close to the, to the electric fence and um, he got shot. So watch out for electricity. It can kill you. Um, okay, so d there are ways to detect electric charges. Um, there are multimeters and different kinds of meters um, that you will, that I will probably learn more about. We do in the other book. In your other book, yeah, it goes more into electricity. So we're introducing electricity today, but we'll talk more about it. And we're also going to do more labs with it too. Um, in your book on page 799, wow, look how far we are already. No, it's not 799, I can't read. <laughs> it's 199. In your book on page 199, I was like, wow, that's a lot of pages. <laughs> uh, anyway, on 199, it shows this little, or th a thing called an Erlenmeyer flask that can be used to detect charges. It's got two little pieces of metal, and if they are charged alike, if there are charges, they will separate just like the little pieces of tape. I used to buy those when I taught public school before, and they do not work good at all. They, those little pieces of metal just bend out and break. The, um, the, they can't really handle the charges. So I thought and decided they were a waste of money. But you can probably find better ones on YouTube and you can see a video of it and, and see how it works. So you should probably do that. Okay, so electric current. So we talked about still electricity, static electricity. Now we're going to talk about flowing electricity. Uh, this is the, the electricity in the stream, the, the electric current. And um, it will go from high voltage to low voltage. You can think of this, that if you have a waterfall, um, that what makes the electricity, what makes the waterfall down the waterfall is gravity. What makes electricity flow is voltage. It's a voltage difference, just like how there's a difference in the height of the land for the water going down the waterfall. There is a difference in the voltage, which is what makes the electricity flow. What flows is not voltage. What flows is current. Voltage is measured in volts. Current is measured in amps. So those are two important things with electricity. The third thing is the rapids. The rapids are resistance. They're the rocks in the stream can make the current resist the current. And we have things that resist current also, resistors. And just natural resistance from the material. Okay, so electricity, the electric circuit, um, you can think of it not as so much as a thing as an event. Um, there used to be an old video called Beekman's World, and how they illustrated this is they had basketballs, and they'd pass them around in a circle, just like a basketball game. But, and that was electricity. And then if one person got taken out of the circle, then the electricity stopped. And that's the, a very good picture of an electric circuit. What is getting passed along are electrons, the electricity. What, what's going on, the, electri the electricity being passed is the electric current. And if it's broken, then it stops. So what breaks electric current is switches. You have a, a conductor material touching each other and the electricity can flow. But then you do the switch and you break the circuit and it will stop, the electricity will stop flowing. And you're used to switches, you turn on light switches all the time. Now, there are different ways of storing electric electricity, and one is batteries. Um, batteries, 
take uh, get take chem chem chemicals and change this the chemicals the properties of the chemicals into electric energy through a chemical reaction. It's a, and if you take chemistry from me, we'll go into a lot of detail, but for um, physical science, we don't really talk about it that much, but it is just a reaction between two chemicals that, path, that makes electrons move. It is called a redox reaction. It's, it's reduction and oxidation. And it's a little bit complicated, and you can learn about it in chemistry. But um, there are different kinds of batteries that have the chemicals that make the reaction, that make the electricity. One is called a dry cell, and it's not really dry. It's a regular battery. If you've ever seen a battery that got ran over in the road or something, it got squished, you see that there's a paste in it. That paste is acid. You don't want to touch it. It's going to burn you. So don't mess with it. You also don't want to ever throw batteries in a fire. They can explode, and then you've got hot acid being thrown at you. Hot paste acid. The other thing you can have is called a wet cell and instead of having paste in it, it's got liquid. And your car battery is one of those and the liquid in it is sulfuric acid, a very powerful acid. It's the number one industrial acid produced in America. Okay, and the yearbook also talks about lead acid batteries and that's the kind that your, um, that your car has. Okay, so resistance is something that resists the flow of current, and we see this in lights. If you've seen a light bulb, just a regular old-fashioned one, not the fluorescent kind, the electricity is moving through the wires. It hits the filament, the little squiggly thing in the middle, and when it gets there, it, re hits, re it hits resistance, and the filament starts glowing white hot, and then some of that electric energy gets converted into light, and um, the electrons produce photons, and the, it goes flying off as light. We also see it in a toaster. The, the electricity is going through the wires, um, then it gets to the little coils in the toaster, it hits resistance, they start glowing red hot, and that heat energy produced is what makes our toast toast. So we're familiar with resistors. You can also buy resistors for electrical projects where you can um, control the flow of electricity by resistors. Just like how you can control a stream by putting up a dam, which would be a resistor to it, um, we sometimes control electricity. Now, there's a couple of, um, there's a formula here, and it is called Ohm's Law. And, it, and it, the thing is, is what it's teaching us is there is a relationship between current, voltage, and resistance. And I like to write it V equals IR because then it says VIR, V-I-R, VIR. The way that your book wrote it is I equals V over R, but it doesn't matter how you write it, it's V equals IR. So the um, unit of current is amps, amperes. The current of the unit of voltage is volts. That makes sense, doesn't it? And the unit of resistance is ohm. That's why it's Ohm's law. Okay, and he figured it out. Name the unit of resistance is named after him. All right, now let, we're going to continue talking about current electricity, and there are two different ways to set up an electric circuit with current. You can have one path for the electricity to go through and it can go through different, they're called loads, or different things you're running. It could be a light bulb, a radio, whatever. But if there's only one path of electricity, um, that is called a series circuit. And it's how light bulbs and houses used to be wired a long time ago. And it would be if one light bulb blew, the whole house, everything electric would end. Or if you had Christmas tree lights and one light bulb goes bad, the whole strand would go bad and you'd have to sit there and try to figure out which one it was. But my life, it's always been parallel. And parallel means it just that there is more than one path for the electricity. So if one bulb goes out, the electricity can still keep flowing. The, the broken bulb does not act as a switch turning it off the electricity can flow and still complete the circuit and the other things run. Now, there's math to do with this, which if you take my physics class, we'll be, do more math with series and parallel, but that's all you really need to know. Houses now are parallel, so um, and most of our wires are all in the walls. 
but um, you could a good job is to be an electrician. You have to go to school because you got to be safe. But electricians are a pretty good job. Um, uh, another thing that about household circuits and other circuits is um, if you have too much current flowing, it can result in electrical fires. And we don't like that. Fires are bad, right? So built into our electric systems are safety things. And one thing is called a fuse. And what it is is they make the current go through this, this path through the fuse, but if there's too much current and it starts heating up, it will melt the fuse and it acts as a switch and it turns it off. Cars have this, so sometimes you're in your car, you turn on the headlights, turn on the radio, it doesn't work, it's because you've blown a fuse. Especially old, like from the 90s back cars seem to have a lot of problems with fuses. Um, even my Mercedes that I used to have from the 2000s, it, I had to go in and change all the fuses. So you can look on YouTube and, and it'll show you how to do it. You can do it yourself. You can buy them at, you know, O'Reilly's. But anyway, they're safety things to keep too much current and there being electrical fires. Now in your house, we don't usually have fuses anymore. A long time ago they used to. But now we have something called circuit breakers. And it's this gray rectangle on, on the wall somewhere in the basement, maybe in the kitchen or something, or in a laundry room. And you open up this little gray door and there's all these switches. And what it does is if there's too much current going through, it flips the switch and it turns it off. How it works is in a principle called thermocouples. That if you have two different metals fused together, and then they will respond to heat differently, and it will cause it to bend. It's um, also how thermostats, I know, used to work. I think now it's more digital. But anyway, you'll get to read more about those. Now, power. I always think of there was this old camp or something my kids did where it was P-O-W-E-R, power. They did a power chant and I always want to do it now. But anyway, there is a formula for power, power and power um, is the rate in which electrical work is done. So power equals the um, current times the voltage and we're going to do a math problem with that in the second part of this video. We're going to do a power video. So come back for the math. And then we're going to do one for um, electrical energy equation, um, which is the energy is the power times the time. So come back and I'll work those two problems for you. And um, they're pretty simple. Bring your calculator. It'll be great. All right. Oh, that's the whole chapter. Boy, that went quick. I like electricity. I think it's interesting. I hope you do too. Like, share, subscribe. I'm Miss Lisa. Come back for part two. Science is great.